Hello and welcome to the RAST Network. What you're about to hear and see is limited to general financial information only. Please be sure to speak to your financial planner or refer to our financial services guide available at rask.com.au slash FSG before acting on the information. Kate Campbell, welcome to this episode of the Australian Finance Podcast. You're always a little bit confused about which podcast you're on, Owen. I always just keep you guessing. Just a few pauses, a few <laughs> little extra milliseconds there. How are you going? I am doing very well and excited to jump into this investing Q&A field of questions that our listeners have sent in. Yes, Kate. As always, it's good to be back and answering questions. If you do have a question, send it in via the link in uh, your podcast player. If you're watching on YouTube, which many people do these days, uh, you can do that in the in the comments or like the description section, sorry. Uh, it's just below the video. Uh, select the Australian Finance Podcast. We are doing Q&As on every channel now every week. So property, business, finance, investing, you name it. Uh, so send them in. But remember that we don't know your personal circumstances. So send us um, a funny name when you send your question in uh, and try to avoid giving us uh, everything in your financial situation because we will have to generalize it no matter what. For example, today we have some fun uh, questions, uh, a lot of investing questions, and we just try and stick to the general uh, matters at hand and the educational lessons. If you do need personalized advice, seek, uh, seek out a financial planner. There's a link in your show notes for that, or you can head to moneysmart.gov.au. And of course, final one uh, is if we do talk about ETFs and super funds and that sort of a thing, read the product disclosure statement, which is available on the website of the thing that you're investing in or whatever. Cool. Well, now we've got the fun stuff out of the way. <laughs> yes. Uh, before we jump into some of the questions, we've got a lot from shares getting delisted to buying in Australia or the US or using cash ETFs. Are you listening to any interesting investing podcasts at the moment? Uh, I have been listening to a few. I've listened to the Invest Like the Best episode with Charlie Munger. I was listening to it this morning on the way in. It's an episode with Charlie Munger, the late Charlie Munger, on the Invest Like the Best podcast channel. So it's just a single episode. And I've listened to that maybe four or five times since it came out a couple months ago. So I was listening to that again this morning. And that prompted me to listen to the Audible version of Poor Charlie's Almanac, which I've since listened to three times this year. Um, it's about nine hours in total. And I've since bought a couple of copies of the book. They're pretty hard to get your hands on. Uh, so that would be that would be one, definitely, Kate. And I'm a prolific listener to Rule Breaker Investing by David Gardner, also out of the US. How about yourself? So you do listen to someone that's not Warren Buffett or Charlie Munger? Absolutely, yeah. And if I had to pick, <laughs> I, I would- I feel like they're your main examples. They're your go-tos. If I had to pick, I'd probably choose uh, the Rule Baker Investing podcast by David Gardner, just because it's more frequent. And if you force me to pick between Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger, I would pick Charlie Munger because he's- they're both brilliant, obviously, but Charlie spent more of his life, I'd say, thinking about- frameworks and mental models and these types of things that other people can apply outside of finance. It just so happens that in finance and investing and business and that sort of thing, they work really well. Um, and both are great, but every chance I could get to listen or read something from Charlie Munger, I would do it uh, because it's not just investing. And that's what I find fascinating about it. But how about you? You listening to anything? Well, not quite investing, but kind of adjacent. There's a really good podcast called If Books Could Kill. Mm. And they... These two guys, I don't even know who they are. I haven't even looked into their background, but they they tear apart some of the most popular self-help books you find in airports. Mm -hmm. um, I think they've done a, one on the Tony Robbins stuff, but hmm. there's even like the 48 Laws of Power, yep. Mark Manson's books. So they all actually, it's supposed to be funny and it's a good one to listen to with friends on a, a road trip, but they pull apart some of the research in there and, are there actually any facts behind this story or do the does the story add up? A lot of people in these books put a story of how they got to where they are mm. and then they look into the background and go, no, that couldn't have actually happened because that person was living here in this time so therefore these events couldn't happen. Mm. And so they, it's, it's sort of a fun, jokey podcast but it's quite entertaining and it does make you go, okay, I'll enjoy this self-help book, but I'm going to listen to it with a great assault. Yeah. What was the name of the podcast? If Books Could Kill. If Books, books Could Kill. Yeah. It's interesting. Uh, it's funny how these kind of like these myths spread really quickly about particular topics. Like a good one is uh, apparently somewhere in the ether, somewhere out there in this digital world, Fidelity did a study and found that all their best performing stockbroking clients were dead. That's something that gets thrown around a lot by podcasters, in books, in news articles, and whatever. 
I'm yet to actually find the source of that that myth. I don't actually think it exists. My understanding is that doesn't exist, but everyone says it because it sounds good. The story is that if you don't trade, um, you'll do well. And who is least likely to trade? Well, people who are dead. Um, so uh, I don't actually think that that's real, but it just mm. serves the narrative. And so people disseminate it widely. Yeah. I just Googled the If Books Could Kill podcast and their tagline is the airport bestsellers that captured our hearts and ruined our minds. So <laughs> there you go. It's very entertaining. So I would recommend it. I always find it interesting, self-help books. I think self-help books are probably uh, a bit more on brand than uh, self-managed super funds, which oftentimes end up with um, being managed by an accountant or a financial advisor, yet self is in the title, uh, which is a bit of a misnomer. But anyway, I digress. What are the questions that we've got this week? All right. The first question is about shares getting delisted. So I'll get Owen to explain a bit about that process before we answer the question. But the question is, if I own shares in a company that's going to be delisted from the ASX, what are things to consider when deciding to hold or sell? So what's a delisting? Yeah. So it's pretty simple to understand that only really the big companies are on the stock exchange. So what happens in a delisting is that effectively the company, for whatever reason, cannot maintain that status. So you will no longer be able to buy or sell those shares through your brokerage account because they are not on the ASX, for example. And so what happens is they become delisted, which is effectively a process of they're just removed from the ASX. You could still trade them if you could find an investor and you could what we call clear the trade. Uh, so the company knows that the shares have changed hands. Uh, but that process is typically very difficult. So in Australia, there are multiple stock exchanges. People don't know this, but um, there's the ASX, of course, which is kind of synonymous with the Australian stock market. Mm. But it's not the only one. There is CBOE, which is the second big one. Uh, then there's another one called the National Stock Exchange, or NSX. Uh, and then there are other, quote unquote, exchanges, such as the one uh, from Primary Markets. Primary Markets is just a small business, and it has set up its own platform for people to tr trade shares. And this is really important to understand because there are over 2 million registered businesses in Australia. Not all of those are company structures, but a lot of them are. So in theory, there is, let's say, over a million companies in Australia, let's say for round figures, but only about 2,500 of them are actually on the stock exchange. Mm. So it's not, you know, it's, it's pretty common that most businesses don't go to the stock exchange. It's just rare that one would be on there and then come off. Uh, it costs a few hundred thousand dollars typically to have your shares on the stock exchange. So a company that's not really profitable would probably end up in a situation where it gets delisted uh, because it makes sense. Other reasons why companies get delisted is they cannot satisfy the regulation. So for example, they, you know, for whatever reason, sometimes nefarious and sometimes it's just you know, mistakes, but some companies can't satisfy the audit requirements where they, there has to be an auditor to check their financials and check what they're saying is true. Some companies can't meet that, so they get suspended. Or they've stopped responding to requests from the ASX for particular pieces of information. Exactly. And so they end up in this kind of weird zone where they're on the stock exchange, but no one can trade them anyway. So eventually they get taken off. And that's obviously a massive red flag for businesses. There are other businesses that just go into liquidation, so they fold, um, in which case their shares obviously disappear and so they get delisted. In that instance, typically most people that invest in those have smaller positions anyway. And if you did get that notice, you'd probably be inclined to sell if you could because what the, the, the probably the big headache from all of this is that it's not always possible to claim the tax loss until you sell or dispose of those shares. And that can take some months, maybe even years after the fact. So you want to be able to sell the shares to just, just simply to incur the loss. Mm. Uh, so then you can write it off against gains that you might make somewhere else. There is exceptionally rare circumstances where companies that delist actually do well. So um, some companies... There was a, a, a brand, a business called Animoca Brands. So Animoca Brands was a gaming company that had some cryptocurrency ties, as far as I'm aware. And what happened is they couldn't satisfy like the, the financials and the requirements and all that upkeep with the regulation mm. that comes with the ASX. So they got booted off effectively, that's my understanding. And they since went on uh, to do really, really, really well. Uh, and people who held those shares probably did well. But that's... That's like that's the exception, not the rule. Typically, when a company delist, K, delist because, in effect, things aren't going as well as planned. There's also the other 
which I think maybe this question is asking that another company is taking over mm. this smaller company. There's a company I hold at the moment where there's a, a larger company saying, we're going to buy this smaller company. Everyone just has to vote. It all has to get yep. ticked off. But if that happens, this is the price you're going to get per share. And then that's the stage where you go, do I wait until that forced takeover happens, basically, because yep. as a small shareholder, I'm probably not going to move the needle. Mm. Or do I sell it now on the market and get that money in my bank account right now? Yeah, so that's a, that's a, that's a probably the most common for bigger companies. Like when I say bigger companies, anything that's in say like the VAS, the three hundred ASX three hundred ETF, um, anything that's like a decent size, that's probably the most common reason why shares disappear in Australia. Uh, we've seen that recently with companies like Altium, which is a business that is a really really top performing technology company. It's getting bought out by a Japanese business, so in effect that will delist. It will disappear. Mm. But when that happens, what what you can expect as a shareholder is you can expect a notice. So it might be like a scheme notice, what they call a scheme notice. It could be really just an ASX update. It could be a media release. The best place to go is the ASX website and go to your company page and then scroll down until you get to the announcements. Or if you haven't changed your settings to email only, you're going to get a big scheme booklet in the yeah. post like I did the other day. Yeah, and that can happen sometimes even if you do select email. Uh, so companies will notify you. But the problem with the... By the time you get the post with the physical document to say what's happening, that could be weeks, maybe even months after something has been rumored or announced to the stock exchange. So you're better off just monitoring um, your company page every now and again. Uh, and you'll notice that because if you open your brokerage app and you see that one's up 30% in a day, typically when a company jumps that mm -hmm. much in a single day, it's because there's been a takeover. So go and explore why and there'll be a media release. Yeah, and often you can set your broker to give you market-sensitive announcements as app notifications and things like that. Yeah. So you don't get all of them because there's often mm. a lot, uh, but you only get the ones that are really key and critical and that pops up and that's a reminder for you to go, okay, I need to be involved. I need to look what's going on. I need to decide if I want to vote for or against. Yeah, there's, a, there's an app that you can use in Australia called Stocklight. Uh, it's an app that just aggregates information. It's built by a guy named Jason who's based here out of Melbourne. And um, the app effectively allows you to make a watch list and then you'll be notified when there's meaningful updates or even research articles that uh, are appropriate for your company. So you can use that for free. Comsec also provides uh, a watch list feature where you can set notifications one by one. You um, don't even have to be using it as your yeah. broker. You can just use it for the watch list feature. Yeah, so for example, other than some legacy shares, I don't use Comsec anymore. And, but I still have the app. Yeah, and you can even set feature. price alerts on Comsec, yep. which is quite cool. So if you want to know when a company falls below this price or goes above this price, if you don't want to be looking at your personal brokerage account too often, you could use that. Yeah, and to be honest, I don't do it really any trading through an app, but that push notification does help me every now and again. I did have to silence it a bit recently because a few of my companies were getting uh, announcements. But just to clear up what Kate said about the cent market sensitive announcements. So basically there's two types of announcements in Australia. There's the ones that are just like, they can blurt out almost anything it seems. That they might be like really unrelated, non, what we, when we say non-price sensitive or just normal updates, it basically means that the company thinks that it's not going to move the share price. Then there are updates that are market sensitive. And like what, an annual report. An annual report, a half yearly report, a quarterly report for a small company. Uh, it might be a takeover announcement. It might be a new product launch. It might be anything that the company believes is material to the long-term performance of that share. Uh, and so those happen, and those are the ones you should pay attention to. If you're owning one of these speculative, maybe a little bit dodgy type small businesses, sometimes companies will use them too frequently. So they'll use that feature too often, which calls into question the credibility of the management team and what they're trying to get from you. So just be aware of that. But most of the time, those are pretty important updates. Yeah. Yep. All right. That's it. Wonderful. Well, the next question is from Falcon. Mm -hmm. If my broker can access Australian and US markets, so you can buy on the ASX and on the US markets, maybe you can switch between them. Mm -hmm. Like Perla, I think you can switch between the yeah, two nice different markets. Yeah, it's What's the difference between buying an Australian ETF that tracks the S&P versus buying in my, the US section of my brokerage account, a US et ETF that tracks the S&P? Yeah, it's a good question. And shout out to Perla. We just mentioned their name. They are a long-term supporter of the Australian Finance Podcast, full disclosure. Uh, so basically, yeah, most people would know that there are ETFs in Australia. There are around about 350 at the time of recording. 
but there are over a thousand in the United States. The most common ETFs in the the most popular ETFs in the United States can have tens of billions of dollars invested in them. I think maybe even over a hundred billion dollars for a few. So when you think about that, they are enormous. A couple of ETFs over there account for the entire ETF market here in Australia. <laughs> so it would be natural that many of our community would want to explore those opportunities. And why not? You know, you're familiar with investing in ETFs here in Australia and you're familiar with investing in US shares like Apple, Google, these types of things. Um, I never use US ETFs, never. And it's pretty simple. The benefit of an ETF is that you can invest internationally from here in Australia. And there are many reasons why you'd want to do that, including your brokerage account here in Australia should offer chess sponsorship or HIN, H-I-N. So you want to invest with that extra layer of security, why not? Uh, I'd like to do that. So I choose Australian ETFs. The most common reason that I think people look overseas for those like US listed ETFs is the fees. And I get this question quite a bit from, from our members as well. Like, why don't we include them in our model portfolios? Mm -hmm. And the answer is pretty simple. You actually open yourself up to US estate taxes and you also open yourself up to that W8 Ben form, which is a tax form that reduces the withholding between Australia and the US as a treaty. And frankly, when you invest in an Australian version, you don't need to do that. So as long as it's tax domiciled here in Australia, like I'll give you the best example I know of, which is the iShares IVV ETF. Um, that has a management fee of 0.04%. The, the, the VTS ETF, which people know here in Australia, is 0.03%. Right? It's slightly different in what they do, but they're both US shares. For the extra 0.01, I would much rather not fill out the W8 Ben form, and I would much rather get a HIN-based holding here in Australia with the IVV ETF than the Vanguard one, the VTS. Now, if the reason why I wouldn't do VTS is because it's tax domiciled in the US. That basically means that the fund itself, for tax purposes, is a US fund. Right? It does basically the same thing, but the IVV ETF has basically created a structure where you invest in the Australian equivalent of the US fund. So you don't have to fill out that form. And I know that people would say that, well, you know, they're both going to the same place. As in the IVV ETF just invests in the US one, which is on the US exchange. And I'm like, yeah, but I also value the simplicity, ease of use, and all those types of things. So I would always go the Australian one. And with 350 ETFs in Australia, the reality is if you're investing in something that's a bit more exotic or unique and you're going to the US to find it, it's probably not that important. As in most of the return that investors will get from the stock exchange or from any investing for that matter will come from investing in ETFs and the asset classes that are already available here in Australia. So you don't need to go overseas to get them. The one reason that I would maintain a US brokerage account is for direct stocks. So if you wanted to buy shares in Apple, for example. Yeah. And the depth is a, is a really impressive when it comes to the US market. So we talk about Apple, NVIDIA, Tesla, Google, Amazon, Microsoft, these types of things. But like companies like Costco, for example, I love Costco. I was there on the weekend. Um, that is a company that appears in some of the big ETFs, but it's not a big position. So if you go further down to the, say, top 100, top 500 in the United States, they only make up a really small proportion of your ETF uh, that you're buying for your core portfolio. But if you want those types of companies, you can go directly through your US brokerage account, like for example, Perla, we mentioned Comsec before, Self-Wealth, all of these platforms do it now. And that's where I would use US um, direct listings. So that's, I hope that explains the question, but I just don't think Aussies need to overcomplicate it for ETFs. And I think for people starting out on their investing journey, it can be an odd idea that you can buy a US ETF on the Australian stock exchange. Yeah. But once you realize you can, you don't need to go far away, mm. metaphorically, because yeah. we can do it all from the couch nowadays, but you don't need to go to the US stock exchange to buy a US ETF anymore. You can yeah. get great ones in Australia. Yeah. So when we first started our RAS Core membership service, it was called RASC ETFs back in the day. Uh, we had the VTS ETF in there. And then after a while, I thought to myself, why would I encourage our members to buy this one when basically exactly the same outcome from the other ETF means they don't have to fill in the tax form and expose themselves to estate taxes? 
uh, in the United States. And so it makes so much sense that you would you would keep things simple for your core portfolio, keep it low cost, keep it secure. So when you're Googling an ETF and looking at their fact page where it says the word domiciled, you want to see Australia. Yeah, yeah, it may as well be. And nearly all of them in, on the ASX are that way. Um, and if you are you, using a US ETF, you can almost guarantee it's US domiciled. Yeah. Yeah, so. Wonderful. All right, next question. What's the difference in benefit and diversity between having money in a high interest savings account or a fixed interest cash ETF like AAA? Do the dividends from AAA beat the interest from a savings account? Uh, I'll take the final question first, which is no. Um, normally the savings account will win uh, because a savings account, because it's variable, like every month it can change, you typically get a higher interest rate at the peak of interest rates, maybe where we are now, for example. Um, with AAA, it's just an ETF. It's a cash ETF that just invests in basically savings accounts or short-term term deposits. That's why when you look at the AAA ETF share price, it looks like a shark tooth, like, or like the mouth of a shark because it goes up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down every month. So basically, it accumulates interest, then it releases it every month. Accumulates interest, then it releases it. And as you'll see over time, it kind of goes up because interest rates have gone up recently. And the, the thing that you need to know about AAA is, and most cash ETFs, is really interesting. It's not why you think they're so popular. Like most people think, oh, you get purchasing power. As in like, we all pull our money together and Westpac gives us a better interest rate. That's actually not why these ETFs are really popular. These ETFs are really popular because financial advisors or even people like us now with Rask Invest, we need a place to put our investors' money before, uh, sorry, we need a place to put our investors' money now where they can earn interest. And by switching, say, a portfolio into AAA, they're going to earn interest. And this is important to understand is because what a lot of people listening to this probably don't realize is that your brokerage account isn't paying you interest. So if you had, let's say- On 50, your cash balance. On your cash balance. So the money you don't have invested. Yeah, I'll give you a good example. So say like Comsec, when you set up an account, they create something called a CDIA. Uh, and basically this is the account that is the where the money comes from for your stock purchase or your ETF purchase. Um, Comsec pays a small, like a small amount of interest, but they keep some of the interest in effect um, from that account. So they do pay interest, unlike say some others, like I think Self-Wealth um, don't. So most people recognize that and they think to themselves, well, I am not going to keep money in that account because I'm not going to earn any interest. And this is really important for retirees who may also be with a financial advisor who use something like NetWealth or Hub24 or one of those platforms they call them or Macquarie, where they may not be receiving any interest. So what the financial advisors do and what we do is we don't we keep the minimum amount of cash in that account that we need to keep it active. And then we just sub in AAA or one of the other cash ETFs. So no matter what, our investors are getting some interest. And this is important for retirees more so than younger people because in a retiree portfolio for round figures, let's say there's a million dollars in the portfolio and it's a diversified, a good portfolio of ETFs are in there. Something like AAA could be 10% or $100,000. So if you don't use that and you just keep it in cash, you're effectively getting no, no income on that 10%, which is a lot for a retiree. That's probably you know a few months worth of their household expenses. So the reason these ETFs are popular is not because that's everyone you know fighting for a better interest rate at the bank. It's actually because there's a weird quirk in the system and financial advisors and people like us need to use them. So if you're a young person thinking, or any person really thinking, I might go into this thing rather than put it in cash, I would go the cash or the term deposit myself and only use this when the money that effectively is going into it is investing money. So let's say you've got a diversified portfolio and as part of your strategy, you do want a little bit of cash in there for the income, which you can then sell in the future and then reinvest into shares when they fall. That's why you'd use this. You wouldn't just put your savings, your emergency fund or anything like that in there. That doesn't make any sense. Because it has fees, plus you're going to have to pay brokerage to enter yeah. and exit your AAA position. Yeah, exactly. And AAA isn't the only one. Full disclosure, BetaShares is a long-term sponsor of the Australian Finance Podcast at the time of recording. So even got the drink bottle right here. Um, so it's important to understand that 
you know, this isn't the only one. There are others. And you also have an alternative of an offset account. If I, like I do, and I know you do too, I would put extra money in an offset account before I put it in something like AAA just for the for those short-term cash needs. And we have spoken about recently on the show as well how good some of the rates are with high interest savings accounts and term deposits are at the moment. So yeah. that is a very valid option to look at as part of diversifying your portfolio. Yeah, absolutely. I'll give you one final example for anyone that is a bit confused. In a self-managed super fund, which a lot of people that listen to this have self-managed super funds, you typically have to have an investment strategy that has to be documented and audited. And you could put that money in a term deposit or you could keep it in your brokerage account where all the tax reporting can be done for you. So a lot of people, instead of putting it in a term deposit, they just keep it in AAA or something like that until they're ready to invest. They just hit sell on AAA and then buy VAS or buy whatever else they're going to buy, BHP, for example. Um, so that's another reason why people like it is because it stays contained in their brokerage account while earning interest. All right, wonderful. The next question's a bit juicy, and it's from Timothy, the tepid trader. Mm -hmm. Why does the stock price not necessarily follow company profits or how they treat their customers and employees? For example, Kathmandu stock has fallen dramatically over the last few years despite record revenue, and Qantas stocks have increased despite a terrible time for their customers and employees. Yeah, okay. So there's basically two questions in this. It's like, why doesn't the stock price follow what r rationally it seems like you're looking at? Um, like it, that's bad news, right? And the stock price goes up. That's pretty common. Um, the other thing is like, why doesn't it follow the profit of a company? So if a company makes more profit, why doesn't the stock price go up? And so there's basically two things you need to understand is that typically in the stock market, we are forward looking. So we look at a company based on its future potential because when you buy it today, you don't get last year's dividend, you get the future dividend. So that's the first thing to understand. And the second thing is that the stock market is not as easy to predict as if this, then that. Like one thing happens and then the other thing happens because in the stock market, there are millions of different actors, meaning that there might be thousands of different investors that are looking at the same stock or ETF or whatever. But then there are other factors that you're probably not even aware of. Things like, well, what's the currency doing today? And does that affect whether a pension fund invests 2% or 3%? What's the RBA expectations for interest rates? You know, there was a, there's a famous kind of, I guess maybe one of those myths is um, from a quantitative trading firm. Um, and they found that when it was sunny in Paris, stocks tended to go up more than when it was raining. And so like, that's just a, such a random thing that has nothing to do with any of the things that were mentioned in this question, but it's still shows that there's some sort of relationship there, but maybe people are in a good mood. So that's the, the reality of investing in stocks is that in the short term, it's based on what people think are going to happen, plus complete randomness. And that's why, in my opinion, it is impossible to predict what stock prices are going to do at any one time. Now, people might say, well, you can use charting and those types of technical analysis skills. For, for my money, I believe they do not work in any possible way. They do not work. Um, because of that, that simple fact, which I just kind of laid out. Now, the other question here is like, in time, should the stock price follow what the company is doing? And absolutely it should. And it typically takes five to 10 years. This is the, this is the thing that people don't get. It's not until the fifth year that mathematically you can prove that a company's performance is the predominant driver of its stock price. Not until the fifth year. So the majority of what's going to happen between now and year five is actually driven by things that aren't related to the company's performance. And that's really important to understand because even though you might say you're a long-term investor with a two-year horizon or a three-year horizon, like if you look back at your brokerage account and you go, Oof, the average period of time that I held these stocks was three weeks or you know, five months, technically in my books, that's not a long-term investor because you haven't actually let the company play out. And with the Qantas example here, I'll give you an example of how all these things come into play. If Qantas raises prices, the consumers will be annoyed, right? If Qantas raises prices, they'll probably make more profit, right? But they could also pay their employees more, which would lead to better customer service, which may mean that the consumer thinks, well, that's a better service for me, which is a good thing, right? Now, if Qantas cuts prices, that's going to be really bad for their profit. 
in the long run. But maybe in the short term, they get more bookings, people find it more appealing. But their staff are now overwhelmed because they're getting paid less and they've got more customers to deal with. And so you can see how very simple decisions can translate into many different outcomes and many different kind of stakeholders being happy or sad. And for my money, I've said this on the show before, is that there's no real clear cut principle of what is ethical and what is unethical. If, if we think about this ethical dilemma, um, there's no real clear cut example. Like Patagonia is often seen, Patagonia, which makes the t-shirts and uh, the founder recently gave up all of his ownership of the company, is often seen as one of the most ethical companies. But I'm sure someone out there could find a reason to say that that's unethical, right? So it's all shades of gray. Uh, and so we could go, we, we'll make a whole series out of ethical investing, but the reality is it's not simple to predict. The only thing that you should do as a result of this question is think long-term. What is going to happen over five or 10 years, not five or 10 days? Uh, and that's your key signal. And if you think like that, the best way to invest is to imagine the most optimistic view of the future and invest according to that, that principle. There's a great webinar, I think you've watched it as well, by Brian Feroldi, yeah. a US investor on YouTube, and it's it's about valuation. I'll find it and put yeah. it in the show notes, but he talks about what drives a company's share price in the short term, the medium, and the long term, and all the different factors that play into that. So I think that would be, if you're interested in this, a really interesting resource. Yeah, to have we a look can at. put a link into that. Um, Brian has since updated that. It's from he did a it's a micro cap club yeah. presentation. He's since updated that. I think the, the title was something very provocative, like why valuation doesn't matter. Yeah, and uh, he since updated that presentation a little bit since stock prices have fallen, but it's a great one. Um, and he is actually referencing research in that, which I've since read, um, that comes from Boston Consulting Group. And there's another one from Morgan Stanley. And they both kind of say the same thing. And it's effectively that you've got to be investing for more than five years to actually determine if the profits and the sales from that business is what is producing the return. And uh, if you just think like that, it actually gives you a very clear picture of what you're trying to do with the stocks that you might own. Um, because in the meantime, everything else is just going to be based on what the next person's willing to pay. Yeah. All right. The final question is from Long-Term Investment Rookie. Mm -hmm. Good name. When choosing an investment, what metrics other than performance are worth looking at to make your decision? I'm assuming, do you, did you get from this, assuming when they say performance, they're talking about stock performance, stock price performance? I think so. That's what a lot of people look to, to yeah. start with. Yeah. Has the company performed well? Okay, I'll invest in it. Yeah, and it's fair enough. Like one of the first things you might see me do on like a live webinar is bring up the stock price. Uh, and for some people, like say David Gardner, who I mentioned hosts that Rule Breaker Investing podcast at the top of the show, he... Uh, he looks at stock price appreciation as a, one of the factors for determining whether it could be a good investment, could be a good investment. Because there's a there's an old saying in investing that you water your flowers, not your weeds. You know, there's this old, there's another one, which is buy low, sell high. But what would in theory be better is buying high and then buying again, because the winners seem to keep on winning. That's the key principle. Because there are quite a few companies listed on the ASX that have done nothing for 10 years and will probably continue to do nothing for another 10. Qantas is a good example. That's what. That's not a company that I would call a winner. Even though it's the best airline, it's, it's in a very hard spot. But uh, a good example in Australia would be a company like WiseTech, which is a software company that it creates software for logistics organizations. So if you need a you know, send a, uh, say a MacBook to the UK, it has to go through customs, has to go through logistics. How do you connect all that? WiseTech does that. Um, and that business has always been really expensive on valuation grounds, but it's a business that just keeps on winning. And you'll look at the stock price and it's hugely volatile, but it keeps going up. Um, but beyond that, if we take this question and loop it back through the previous question about, you know, that five-year kind of window, if you think about that, you should be focusing most of your attention on what is going to work well in five to 10 years, not what's going to work well in one to two years. Because in the short term, what you're basically trying to do is you're trying to predict what other people are going to think. So you're trying to predict whether next year someone will move on from AI and think back to crypto or back to cannabis stocks or whatever. Those types of frothy types of themes can work well. They'd be there for a good time, not a long time. Um, 
But if you want to be a true long-term investor like Warren Buffett and all those wonderful people, you need to think about the business. And so how do you do that? You look at things like its competitive advantage, like its brand and those types of things, how well it can grow over the next 10 years, not just for the next one to two. You have to look at the management team. Do they own shares? Are they aligned? You have to look and think to yourself, a bit of self-reflection, is this a business I understand? It's by circle of competence. And finally, you may want to just have a little bit of an understanding of what it's valued at. Because sometimes like in the dot-com boom and the GFC, there were really overvalued businesses. Most people put valuation first. They go straight to the, is it a good dividend yield? Does it have a good price earnings ratio? That should be the last thing. Firstly, let's make it through your checklist of, does this actually seem like a good business? And for ETFs, you can apply similar but different metrics. But what you basically fundamentally want to know is, is the thing that my ETF is investing in, does it sit in my core or does it sit in my satellite? And they're two very different things. Core is obviously low cost, diversified, long-term focus with a proven track record. For the satellite, things get a bit spicy, have a bit of fun, but also keep it contained to say 20 or 25% of your portfolio at max, like across all satellites. I The, the satellite is optional for most people. Mm. Yep. Well, there we go. Lots of questions, lots of answers. Yeah, Hopefully we do have a lot of courses to match all those questions. Yes, so uh, we've got courses on ETF investing, share investing, ethical investing, which challenges you to think about, well, what do you value in a company and what does your best version of the future look like? Yeah, absolutely. We've also got you know, our road trip courses, which are six modules that wrap together around cash flow, paying off debt, these types of things. So there's a course to basically match every single question here. And this isn't a massive sell from us. They're all free. So you can just go in there and take one if you want to. But if you uh, resonated with any of these things, we don't have one on shares getting delisted. That's quite rare. But the rest of them, um, it's all in there. So go and check it out. And um, to your heart's content, enroll in all those courses because they're free. Um, but that's it, Kate. It's been a good Yep. I love and if questions. you also have questions about investing or any of the other topics we cover, like property and business and personal finance, there's a link in your podcast player that says, ask a question, jump in there, send us your questions, and we'll get to them in the next episode. Absolutely, Kate. As always, thanks for joining me. Thanks for listening, everyone. Thanks for watching this video on the RAS Network. While you're here, don't forget to like and subscribe so you can get videos each and every day on business, finance, investing, and so much more. Mm. Number 27 from Port Adelaide was really good. Got a lot of marks. Okay, Owen, Q&A, March. Kind of blues. All right, here we go. March. We're doing the March investing Q&A.